to our third presentation of the afternoon from Daniel and Angela. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the last presentation for today, this afternoon, um, is on the topic test score use in university admissions. I can see already in the audience that there are fellow researchers and other stakeholders working within this area or topic. So we're going to talk a little bit about issues around as well as beyond assessment literacy in this area about test score use in university admissions. First of all, um, this presentation is based on a research project that was funded by IELTS Joint Research, uh, Joint Funded Research Program 2018. So we would like to take this opportunity to thank their support throughout the process, especially uh, the last phase of our project was done during the uh, pandemic. Um, so they've been really understanding with uh, any sort of delays to, to our progress. Uh, and I also want to take this opportunity to thank the whole research team. Um, this was a cross-institutional case study. So as you will see in a minute, we sampled uh, different asset, uh, ambition contexts from different institutions in the UK. But this was also a, a cross-institutional collaboration uh, among different universities in the UK. So there is me and Tony from Crella. Um, there is Neil from University of Warwick and Angela, who is also presenting this afternoon uh, from University of Glasgow. So before we go right into the, the project itself, I thought we would start by considering um, this general context of um, test development or test production and test use or using test scores. So you're not in the wrong presentation. This is actually the right presentation and these are the right pictures that I'm aiming to show. Uh, but that th these pictures are not added after Sarah's presentation. Um, but oftentimes actually test production or test development has been um, likened to or compared with uh, the, the production process or manufacturing process for cars. In fact, this is not a, a Daniel Lamb original metaphor. This metaphor comes from Tony Green, in fact, in his book. Um, again, the latest edition is just out. So if you're interested, you can take a look. Uh, but as you can probably imagine, that the development of standardized language tests um, is a little bit like car manufacturing because there are so many different stringent quality assurance procedures from test design stage, development of test tasks or test items to thinking about test delivery up to scoring procedures. All these different stages, um, there are stringent quality assurance procedures. And that is quite like manufacturing cars and making sure each car, even for the same model, is produced to specification, produced identical, and that all they're, uh, they, they're up to the quality standard. Now, apart from producing the product or developing the product, how the product is eventually used by users is arguably as important as the development or production process. Um, and you probably can think about, you know, the case where, you know, when, when, when you have a car produced, if it's a, like in the, uh, in the picture, uh, if it's a small hatchback, you know, city car, but the user, the customer is taking it for car racing and often drives it, you know, at 140 miles per hour, you would think that this is not what the car manufacturer wants. This is probably inappropriate use of the car. It's not being used uh, according to how the car was intended, how the car is uh, designed, the intended use of the car. But you can also imagine that this is something that is much more difficult uh, to control on the part of the test of, uh, on the part of the car manufacturer. And similar thing can be said about. Um, test providers and test development and test use, how the tests and test scores are eventually used by score users are very important, but it's often more difficult to control 
uh, in terms of what the test developers can do. And all these aspects of test development as well as test use, uh, these are captured by notions um, proposed by first by McNamara and Ryan 2011, but also written into the more recent book by McNamara and colleagues uh, in terms of the notion of fairness versus or fairness and justice in language assessment. So by these, we mean that in terms of fairness, we're looking at the quality of the test. And this is typically classified as internal to the test. Whereas if we think about justice in language assessment, uh, these are aspects external to the test, and it usually has to do with the defensibility of the policies and values that are implicit in the use and interpretation of the test. And if you think of uh, the different sort of validation frameworks, uh, test development and validation frameworks available for language tests, and I'm showing one particular example, which is the sociocognitive framework uh, developed by Sarah Weir and often used in Krella's um, test development and validation work. This would fall, uh, what we're talking about today would fall into the domain of consequential validity. So how the test is uh, being used and what consequences it's producing in the wider society. So now I'll hand over to Angela um, to introduce the study to you as well as uh, communicate uh, one of the two major findings or aspects of major findings from this study. Thank you so much, Daniel. So we were specifically interested in looking at test score use in university admissions processes. We had a number of sub research questions, but our two main ones focused in turn on how test scores are used and on how test scores are set. So our project took the shape, as Daniel has already mentioned, of a cross-institutional case study. And we felt that this particular approach filled a methodological gap, which has been identified by Lloyd-Jones et al. 2012, who discussed the need for in-depth comparative work such as this. Our focus on admission selection practices also addressed a lacuna in the field. So while a considerable number of typically survey studies have been conducted looking at staff knowledge and attitudes, there remain few studies examining admission selection practices. Our study therefore responds to calls for more research on student recruitment procedures and the role of language proficiency in both the test score use literature and the internationalization literature, internationalization of higher education literature. Daniel, can I have the next slide? So what you can see on the slide now, thanks Daniel, is an overview of our case study contexts. Data collection settings A to F were chosen to represent diversity along three specific characteristics, namely level of decision making, so that could be institutional, departmental or pre-sessional, level of study, which could be undergraduate, postgraduate or pre-sessional as well, and also type of university. And note that contexts A and E represent different decision making levels at the same institution. Can I have the next slide? So to offer some slightly more detailed information about our processes of data collection and analysis, we first conducted semi-structured interviews with our informants in each context. And the interview questions were themselves informed by our reviewing of the website information from each respective university. So this could be information relating to minimum language test scores, including minimum sub scores per skill, and also any alternative pathways that were used to meet language proficiency conditions. Uh, the questions that were the questions were therefore adapted slightly to align with each specific context according to that information that we had found. Furthermore, the interviews which were conducted at later stages were actually informed by lessons that we learned from conducting earlier ones. For example, minor modifications were made to the way the questions were worded and additional questions were also added on the basis of preliminary stages of analysis. In terms of data analysis itself, the interviews were first of all deductively coded to group responses according to preliminary themes and the interview questions that were asked. It was then a stage of inducting, inductive coding to allow themes to emerge. 
And one interview was in fact double coded by two of the research team who then had a follow up discussion to resolve any potential discrepancies. When it came to developing the case studies, this was done according to broad themes common to all cases, as well as to themes which had emerged specifically from certain contexts. The next stage was to hold a panel discussion which comprised the four members of the research team, as Daniel has outlined, who represent a broad range of expertise in terms of admission selection, language assessment and standard setting, and also the internationalisation of higher education. At this point in the panel, they were joined by three IELTS partners representatives with roles in engaging with school users. The nature of this panel discussion focused on a critical examination of findings from the case studies and considered ways to further engage with score users. The final stage was an integration of overall themes by exploring the similarities and differences between the views of the panel members and those of the case study informants. Some of the emergent findings are of course going to be presented here today. Can I have the next slide? So now we're going to turn our attention to the first of our research questions, namely how are test scores used in admissions making decisions? So our first key point here relates to the values attached to different types of evidence for language proficiency. So how does the use of test score evidence compare and contrast with the use of previous English medium education evidence as an indicator of proficiency? So one informant spoke of waiving a language test score several times in their interview. Waiving something entails that there's a rule that needs to be temporarily ignored or suspended in an exceptional case. And the thing that's being waived is otherwise the norm, the default. And namely, of course, in this case, this is language test scores. Interestingly, there were suggestions in our data that prior English medium study was perceived as indicating better preparedness for academic study in the UK than language test scores themselves. So one other informant indicated that incoming students who already had experience of English medium education have had the opportunity to better familiarise themselves with the learning culture and its requirements and expectations compared to students who were admitted on the basis of language test scores. Overall, the general sense from the case study informants was that language test scores such as IELTS were the primary means of evidence for language proficiency, with other evidence forms being used somewhat peripherally. When this issue arose in the panel discussion, one panel member, an IELTS partner representative, indicated that in fact it should be the other way around, to quote them specifically, i.e. that IELTS should be seen as the alternative when evidence of English medium study is not available. And we think this is an interesting finding about contrasting views between our university informants, who so our case study um, informants involved in test score use, compared with our panel discussion participant. Can I have the next slide? Oh, thanks. To understand more about the different possible forms of language proficiency evidence and how they were viewed and used in admission selection practices, we'd like to highlight here the main contributing factors that emerged from the case study. The first of these is trustworthiness, which relates to the authenticity and genuineness of the type of evidence. And this could relate to points such as the security associated with specific standardised tests, so the extent to which admission staff have confidence in the security and therefore the authenticity of the test scores and the transparency of the procedures through which they're generated. And this in turn underpins their acceptability as evidence. Another point relating to trustworthiness might connect to writing samples or personal statements being used as evidence for language proficiency, as it's possible that there could be a question over genuine authorship and therefore the extent to which this evidence presented can be trusted. And we've got there on the, the screen the next one, which is the question of representation. And this relates to the kinds and levels of proficiency that a specific kind of evidence is indicative of. An example of this was shown on the previous slide when I talked about one case study informant believing that English medium education experience represented greater preparedness for academic study in the UK compared to language test scores as proficiency indicators. Efficiency, which is our next factor, relates to how straightforward a type of evidence is 
compared to others to process, which we think is an especially pertinent consideration in the context where there's a very large number of applications which need to be screened within given time constraints, within specific time constraints. To offer an example, it was mentioned on multiple occasions by case study informants, the possibility of one-on-one -on -one interviews as a useful and somewhat reliable means of determining language proficiency. Although this is, of course, a much greater investment in terms of time and resources and is likely impossible when there are thousands of student applications to be dealt with. Fairness and transparency were seen as providing a good foundation for what could perhaps be perceived as inflexible selection practices and decisions on individual applicants that appear counterintuitive, while transparency in the use of uh, in the use and weighting of different forms of evidence was accorded high importance by one of our panel members. Finally, Agency related to the extent to which there was flexibility in the approach taken by admission staff to these matters. Informants reported being somewhat bound by decisions that were taken by higher up bodies in their institution. For example, where departmental admission selection practices necessarily needed to align with those set by the institution. Multiple informants also mentioned the need to adhere to visa requirements as well, of course. So having given a sense of the key findings relating to test score use, I'd now like to pass you back to Daniel, who will offer some information about test score setting. Thanks very much, Angela. So we're going to look at some findings uh, about how minimum scores are set here for university admissions contexts. And the first main finding uh, across the different case studies uh, was that there are certainly layers and layers of formal approval processes and committees. However, according to our uh, informants, as far as they know, um, there are no formal standard setting exercises being uh, done or carried out um, uh, during the, the approval processes. Um, so with the layers and layers and approval processes, these usually uh, start at the sort of local or departmental level uh, and then moving their way up to maybe faculty and school level and finally to the institutional level such as the uh, vice chancellor groups uh, but as I said before um, no formal standard setting exercises as far as our informants are aware of. This is of course uh, different from uh, the recommendations by the IELTS score guide and guidelines from the uh, BALIB, uh, British Association of Lecturers uh, for English, uh, English for Academic Purposes, uh, in which they would recommend uh, a formal standard setting procedure involving a specific panel membership. Now I'm going to show you two quotes, and this is from a departmental um, context where the program director has the experience of sitting on panels where uh, these discussions about setting or reviewing uh, score, minimum score requirements are held. And this is what she said. So she said, I think it's quite a diverse way of arriving at a number. And again, my impression is that it's quite a random number that's arrived at. And further on, she added that to me, it's a fairly heuristic kind of process. So people just come up with a number that's either sort of traditional that they've experienced or heard of before and say, oh, if this program has this number, then maybe our program should have this number or that number. So this actually also echoes uh, previous studies findings about how test scores, uh, minimum test scores are set for university admission contexts. The second finding that emerged in our case study uh, case studies uh, is that there seems to be a gap in dialogue between different levels, so specifically levels of policy making and policy implementation. So, for example, one of our central emissions officer um, said to us that I don't know how the entry criteria were set. So when you are an admissions officer, you just had, this is our entry criteria, and you just make sure that they met their criteria, the students met their criteria. Now, how people decided what the entry criteria actually is, I don't know. 
So this is what she reported. And in fact, this quote is representative of uh, a wider admission by almost all of our informants that um, they, they, admit, they almost uh, unanimously admitted to a lack of knowledge of the specific procedure or process of setting score requirements uh, across these six contexts. So they don't know about the precise mechanisms involved. They don't know the precise basis uh, or bases for setting or reviewing score requirements. These remain opaque to admissions officers who are implementing the policy and processing the applications on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, the Bali guidelines that I mentioned just now uh, actually recommend it for uh, a, a formal standard setting procedure and for the standard setting panel to ideally include different stakeholders. So the stakeholders that could include um, are admission staff who are processing the applications, academic staff from programs that receive and have to um, communicate with uh, and teach international students, marketing and international staff who can supply information on uh, recruitment targets and relevant pools of applicants, as well as English for academic purposes staff who can offer guidance on language. But as evidenced by um, this informant's quote, as well as more generally our case studies, uh, currently it seems that um, admission staff who are processing applications are not included in the decision-making process in terms of setting the minimum score requirements. And this is um, a quote from our panel discussion, and this panel discussion member has identified similar issue in terms of a gap in dialogue and suggested something uh, accordingly. So what this panel member said was that what would be really good is if in one of those training seminars or events arranged uh, for test score users, if you had a combination of administrative staff plus academic staff, so that they could sit together and have the same information and go back and have those discussions. Because the one thing that struck me throughout this afternoon, critically examining the, the results of the case studies, uh, is that there seems to be a lack of discourse internally within institutions between the people. And that to me is the missing link. And the third uh, theme that emerged from our um, case studies regarding setting minimum scores uh, is have to, ha has to do with awareness or unawareness of guidance from test providers and other uh, professional organizations such as Barleep. Now, um, both central admissions officers uh, from our case studies A and B attended IELTS training seminars. So um, they are aware of the guidance and they are also um, equipped somewhat with information about the test itself and what the test scores mean when they look at applications. Uh, and in fact, they said that the tra training seminar has been useful in getting them a sense that, okay, if a student has IELTS score six, what is he or she gonna sound like when, when they're talking? Because they're shown examples uh, test performance samples during the training seminar. So they know a little bit more about what each test score band means. However, both um, EAP coordinators that we interviewed and one departmental uh, admissions officer, so admissions officer at a departmental level, reported being unaware of the IELTS uh, guide for institutions. Um, and in fact, so also from um, what they reported during the interview, it seems that the policy making personnel um, in so far as they reported are largely unaware of information again on um, standard setting procedures or on standard setting panel membership. These guidelines that are offered either by Baileep or by the IELTS partners, they're not aware of those in, uh, pieces of information or guidance that are available. Um, so it seems that staff at the policy implementation level, so when they're processing applications, uh, making decisions, they, are, they seem to be the most aware of guidance from test providers on these matters. But the people who are setting the minimum score requirements, as far as these informants 
are, uh, are able to report, um, those decision makers are less aware of guidance available uh, from um, Bali or from IELTS partners So on these issues. So there is a possible mismatched distribution of knowledge about test score use. And a further complication that was um, reported during our panel discussion by the IELTS partners representatives uh, is that well, we say that the policy makers might not be so aware of guidance available. So let's try and get them, you know, uh, to, to tell them about our, uh, the guidance that, that's available. But it's actually very difficult to identify who those policy makers are because they vary from institution to institution who exactly uh, makes the policy who exactly set the minimum score requirements. And in fact, one of the representatives said to us that it's like finding a needle in a haystack. So it's very difficult to identify who the policy makers are in setting minimum score requirements. And this further complicates the issue in terms of um, trying to make aware guidance uh, on standard setting procedures, panel membership, uh, et cetera. Yes, so there's a mismatch distribution. So from all these different findings, we have a couple of reflections. So in terms of um, assessment literacy issues and beyond assessment literacy issues in, in the context of test score use, uh, we saw in what we've reported today that there is some evidence uh, of awareness of guidance and knowledge of the test scores and, and the test scores meaning uh, among admissions staff, uh, people who are implementing the policy uh, and processing applications. So they clearly work at the policy implementation level and they are tasked uh, with ensuring compliance with score requirements. However, one key thing to notice is that they are without the power to effect change, at least Currently, they're not involved, directly involved in panels who are setting minimum score requirements. And on the other hand, as far as our informants have reported, the kind of relevant knowledge uh, and awareness of guidance um, may not have penetrated the policymaking level uh, where the power is wielded uh, to effect change and where the requirements, score requirements are set. So there is this tension in a way. And finally, um, thinking about the whole context of test score use and the role of assessment literacy, we would say that uh, assessment literacy is certainly very important, a, a very important component uh, within practices in test score use and interpretation, but there are also uh, many other factors that are involved and equally important and probably interacting with assessment literacy. So our reflection is that previous studies, such as O'Loughlin uh, 2011, found that the IELTS guidelines for minimum score setting were downplayed or altogether ignored, giving way to uh, market competition for international students. And the case studies in this research further identify a nexus of factors contributing to test score use practices. So as I said, at the level of, or in the aspect of assessment, literacy, this concerns perhaps the knowledge of language tests, what the test scores mean uh, for each language test, because they sometimes test different things uh, while tre being treated as equivalent. Um, the skills for standard setting, the knowledge for standard setting, and awareness of guidance that are provided by ass ass assessment specialists or test uh, providers. And one other lesson that we've learned is that it is important to view assessment literacy not just as a yes no question or even as a, you know score one to five people having high levels of assessment literacy or low levels of, of li assessment literacy but throughout this project we've learned that it is also a very much a matter of distribution of uh, knowledge and distribution of assessment literacy across different decision-making entities. So it's very much a question of who needs to know what and how much. Uh, but of course, assessment literacy in test score use, in the context of test score use, 
it's not in isolation. It interacts with institutional priorities when it comes to practices in test score use and setting minimum scores. So uh, I think I don't need to say this very much, but everyone is aware that in terms of institutional priorities, there is a big driving force in terms of student recruitment and, and, and the motivation to, to secure as many um, international students as, as a university can to secure that market share. And that interacts with what they know about um, using test scores as well as setting minimum score requirements um, in the decision making. And of course, there are codes of practices, which uh, two of which I've mentioned um, today. One is the guideline from Bali, and the other is the IELTS guide for institutions. Um, and these codes of practice can certainly help improve assessment literacy in test score use, but we see that it's also very much a balancing act between codes of practice and institutional priorities. And in particular, we need to think about how motivated institutions are in responding to codes of practice or what motivates them to respond to codes of practice in particular ways. And also by extension, what roles um, can different stakeholders and perhaps regulatory bodies can play in terms of um, making changes to practices in test score use. So all these are a sort of whole nexus of factors as well as um, entities and which interact with one another uh, in practices of test score use. And we think that this is a kind of valuable lesson we have learned from taking a case study approach and comparing different contexts and different um, cases um, as opposed to a more large scale survey study uh, on assessment literacy. So, Obviously, different uh, research approaches have their own strength, and I think different valuable lessons can be learned and have been learned um, throughout this um, endeavor by different researchers in terms of um, language assessment literacy needs um, for different um, stakeholders in assessment. Finally, I just want to draw your attention quickly to some resources and updates. Um, so if there are um, stakeholders among us today uh, who need to sort of engage in test score use in university admissions context, um, the IELTS guide that I mentioned um, is accessible through their website and the BARLEAP testing guidelines are all also available on the BARLEAP's uh, website. And I know that Beverly Baker is today uh, with us today, so I, I don't know whether she wants to make a, an advertisement later on in the Q&A session, uh, but I just want to draw your attention also to this survey uh, organized by the International Language Testing Association recently, a survey, survey with admissions decision makers, which is still available. So you can, um, it, especially if you are uh, one of the stakeholders who needs to work with using test scores uh, in university admissions context on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we encourage you to, to take this survey to help us know more about your needs and your views. So thank you very much. I don't know how I've done with time. I might have gone over, but that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. No, I think I think your timing, um, thank, and Angela, thank you both. I think your timing um, is absolutely uh, spot on there. Well done for that. And um, you you won't have been aware while well, you've been presenting, but um, yes, there's been uh, a really wide ranging discussion going on in the uh, chat, um, uh, triggered by your um, presentation. And um, one of the first questions which somebody um, asked um, was, did you know, did you get any sense of whether um, any of the decision making processes, um, that the COVID has altered those at all um, uh, for the participants in your study? Um, what I can say is that our, well, we originally had one more admission context um, to, to, well, uh, personnel to, to uh, interview, 
Um, however, that was cancelled at the last minute because of COVID-19 and, and what the pandemic has brought to. Obviously, if you, you were involved uh, in any sort of university admissions, you would know how much of a chaos that has caused. Um, and so this is not officially part of the study, but from what we are we were gathering and what we were aware of is that there is a rush of um, uh, the need for, you know, ad adopting uh, uh, or accepting language tests that were not previously accepted for university admissions purposes, because obviously face-to-face mm. -face testing was suspended uh, in the majority of places in the, around the world. And so um, there is this whole emergence of online tests that are available and people had to sort of come to the decision um, whether to accept them uh, and you know what what would be the cut score for, for those tests. Mm. Um, if, if anyone else has anything to add, maybe Tony or Neil, I've made Neil to be a presenter as well if you want to comment on that, but not to put you in the, in the spot. <laughs> Okay, um, and one of the other questions that I can see um, that um, came up <coughs> were regarded um, whether you got any idea about what was considered to be, um, what was or wasn't considered to be an acceptable waiver in terms of um, saying, okay, well, we don't have to take this score into consideration. I assume that, that when somebody didn't have um, a certain score, did you get um, any idea about what was what sort of things were acceptable? Say, okay, well, we can make an exception in this case. It wasn't so much um, as sort of exceptional case, or well, but the the fact that English medium degrees or prior qualifications, so, so degrees as well as uh, secondary education qualifications were accepted as alternatives, but these are usually a very strict list uh, each university has compiled. So if the applicant was able to present that, then that can be accept, uh, accepted as uh, meeting the language proficiency requirement. Uh, but it was particularly in case study C uh, that was mentioned in, in, in our presentation where um, there was talking of, you know, waiving a test score and that is in terms of, yeah, accepting certain English medium degrees or when your nationality is one of the majority English speaking countries um, and mm. that could be said to be sort of waiving test scores. Yeah. Okay. And one of the other issues which um, came up a, a lot in the chat, um, which I don't know whether um, uh, anybody <laughs> would like to comment on, was that actually um, a lot of these issues actually are market driven and that um, there seemed to be um, uh, the, this idea that um, if one course one university says oh well that's what we're going to accept and, and i think you might mentioned that in your presentation that um then other courses or other universities would say oh well no, then that's that's we'll we'll accept that level as well and obviously there is this um certainly in the uk higher education is is, is a very competitive um uh business and um setting, deciding where those, um, uh, what levels are acceptable, what levels of English different qualifications are acceptable um, are, is affected not just by UK, um, the UK VI decisions, but also um, by universities' desire to recruit students. So yeah. um, I don't know whether you wanted to make any comment on that. Um, well, I guess first of all, I would say that yes, it's certainly a. It's, I'm hearing some sort of buzzing. Yeah, so yeah. Let me I can hear that as well. Yeah, sorry, it doesn't make any difference. And Daniel, can you try muting and just see if it's yours? But 
I hope it hasn't stopped. Tony, would you try muting for a moment, please? I did. That seems to have stopped it by turning it on again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. um, on this um, issue, I think maybe Tony and Neil and maybe Angela might want to add something, but I'll just mention that this is certainly a theme that emerged in our case studies, yeah. uh, as mm. well as discussed among the panel um, as a, probably one of the primary driving forces in universities' uh, decision making in terms of setting minimum scores uh, and to an extent also uh, in the decision making for, you know, when, when they process applications and deciding what types of evidence they would accept uh, and perhaps sort of increasing the variety of evidence that they would accept that featured in one of our case studies. So when they look at uh, recruitment, um, and when they look at student markets or, or the, their target student markets, they would see what qualifications um, students from that place uh, would be able to supply and then they would they would then go on to examine whether this qualification can be accepted to meet the requirements mm. Mm. yeah yeah I'm sorry I can see yeah. Neil yeah please feel free oh well, unfortunately I think the buzzing might have come from your side and we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry, Neil. We, we, we can't hear you. We seem to have a um, uh, some nasty interference. Neil, would you mind muting your mic for a moment? Okay. Ah, it stopped. That's better. Oh, uh, sorry. It's not. <laughs> But you can, <laughs> if you're able, you can type in what you wanted to say in the chat box, yeah. though, maybe. Okay, unfortunately, yeah, I think we're having difficulty getting uh, 